Welcome to the Propreneur Podcast, where we help practice owners become better entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Dino Watt. Welcome once again, everybody, to the Propreneur Podcast. Excited to have you here again for another great day of learning and understanding how we can put the best practices possible inside of your business. My name is Dino Watt, as always, your host, and I'm excited to bring to you our guest today, who was actually referred to me from one of our most popular guests, Manal Pat, who is awesome and just so much fun. And she said, Dino, you got to get together with Sherry Jolly and you got to have a conversation with her. So Sherry, thank you for being willing to be on our show today. Oh, well, thanks for having me. I, I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Well, I got to tell you, one of the things that we always look for is for not only people who are going to refer somebody to be on the show is always great. But then when they have a great service to offer, uh, that makes it even better. And that's definitely the case here. So before we get started, what we like to do on this show is we always like to dive into your story because we believe stories actually connect all of us. So tell us your story. How did you get inside into this industry? Uh, where you're from? All the fun stuff. Okay. Well, I'm from Ohio. Um, I've been in central Ohio for probably 15 years, but I, I'm just basically from Ohio. Um, I started my first real grown up job, like my first adult job in a dentist office. I was at the front desk. I was 19. Um, I, I worked for a dentist who loved to talk and teach people. So I learned a lot from him. Um, but it was an office that um, had a paper schedule and yellow ledger cards where we hand wrote balances and had to do the math ourselves on that. And then we would wow. send statements to the patients. And that was in the early nineties um, was when I started there. And from there, I had, I didn't go to college right out of high school. So I was working my grown up job. And then from there I became a chair side assistant. Then I decided to go to hygiene school because I just kept going in dentistry. Like as going I was going down the hole. <laughs> yep. As I was, as I was um, turning into a real grown up, going from a 19 year old, you know, that was so cool. The doctor took me to the midwinter meeting. Chicago's a lot of fun on someone else's dime. Sure. Um, <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. And then I, I went to hygiene school, but in the middle of hygiene school, I transferred to business school. And then when I came out of, uh, high, of school and graduated, I focused in on practice management. And I was a practice manager in a, a, a regular, just private office. And then I was in a corporate office and I started to see the same things over and over again. So after, after doing my practice manager stuff, I realized that um, I came to a point where I had to choose every day, am I going to manage the money, the billing, the accounts receivable, or am I going to manage the practice? Because I was a legit practice manager. I did the, I did all the HR. I did all kinds of real management stuff. I had to take care of all of those issues, but I also realized that the billing was full time. And mm -hmm. the other thing I noticed is that I had been doing the billing for years and, and the payment for years. And I noticed it was taking longer and requiring more work to get the same amount of money. Mm. And so when I kept pushing to get another person to do the billing, the doctor was like, but we're not going to make more money. So that was a recipe for burning out office managers everywhere I've ever seen. And I began to talk to women my age in my thirties at that time. And um, I noticed that office managers do have a burnout date. <laughs> they have an expiration date. Oh, and, no. um, then I started looking into just solutions for this problem. And I realized that outsourced billing was becoming a thing. When I started Dental Support Essentials, there was only four companies that did it. Wow. And I was, um, now if you Google dental billing, you get, I don't know how many Google pages you can find. But um, when, I, when I did it and I just looked into it and I thought, you know what, I could do that. I, I can do that. And I started, that's how I started on Dental Support Essentials. And I began, be, you know, most of it, just learning how to, knowing that, office managers are not properly trained. They're yeah. just all thrown in there and told to figure it out. And then I, as I started my company, I started getting calls from accounting firms, accountants of dentists saying, go in there and figure out what's wrong. 
And then, you know, they should be making money. They shouldn't have an AR this big. They shouldn't do that kind of stuff. And over the last five years, I have just really decided that not only is my billing service very important for overworked staff, just taking things off their plate, but training people how to do the financial part in the dental office is just as important. They weren't trained. The, high, the doctor hires a hygienist, right. they're trained. They hire a dental assistant. Sometimes they go, come from a technical school, but they come from a certificate program usually, and they've had training. The front desk just has to guess and search around and Google and click buttons till they figure out till it works. And I have found some geniuses who really just whipped everything into shape. And then I found some people who figured out how to make something happen. And they ended up maybe not actually helping the practice, but how could anybody know? Nobody even told them how to do their job. And the doctor didn't know nope. what he was supposed to be helping them with. He didn't even know how to get them better skills. And so that's kind of what we have turned into. I have been cleaning up AR. I have been, uh, well, me, my company, I, there's, there's 11 people here. It's not just, sure, right. yeah. it's, not, it's not just me, but um, yeah, we've been cleaning up accounts receivable and almost every time we spend probably four or five hours on a zoom call training them on, you know, did you know your software did this and you didn't have to spend five minutes doing this. You could just use your software better. Um, and you don't have to pay more for this, just your software already does it. That I, that's a theme of almost every practice that I look at, but yeah. Oh, really? Some of the, the unknowns that you get to reveal to them. Oh yeah. They, and I, I love it when it's something as simple as like, if, if you do this, it takes you two minutes. If you do it this way, it takes you 10. And then they're like, oh my gosh, you saved me two hours a day. And I like to joke and say, yes, it's because I'm magic. I stood beside you and your computer works better, That's but, right. <laughs> but the, you, should, you should run with that. You should always tell them that. I, I, I do, but then I have to leave. I can't stand beside every computer. So I have to tell them the secret that really the software you pay for does that for you. And you just, nobody taught you how to use it. Wow. And there's a, there's a lot of that, right? Like you had even talked, uh, alluded to that earlier where it's like, people are learning from people who didn't know. And so they pass on what they didn't know and they pass on even maybe bad stuff, right? Stuff that they, they figured out themselves, but it's not the right way to do it. Well, yeah, the best example I can give is um, I, I just took over an office and every ID number is a social security number. And there mm -hmm. half of the insurance companies don't take social security numbers as ID numbers anymore. They issue an, a unique ID number. So I know why your claims aren't paid is because the ID number isn't the social security number. And so mm -hmm. um, your insurance company didn't process your claim. Um, and so now I have to go find the ID number for every patient. Well, not me. Logan has right. to do that, but sure, sure. We, we have to do, you know, that. that's what they need to do. Yeah. That's what they need to do. But, um, that's, that's just kind of things. That was the old way of doing it back in the nineties. That was the way we did it. We always use the social security number, but now in 2020, we don't, we use right. the, the ID number. So those are things, sometimes it's just old information. Things have changed quite a bit. Technology has changed quite a bit. So, um, that's part of it. Sometimes it's just not the right info anymore. And they don't understand what's really fraud and what isn't fraud. Um, part of, part of my journey was becoming a fraud examiner. And wow. so, yeah, so I started, um, but the reason I did that was because I ran into fraud too many times. Sure. And, um, a lot of times it was unintentional mistakes, but the mistakes were so many and so often and so systemic that we had to like, it was like, you don't understand what you're doing is so wrong that we have to change everything. Now I, I have I don't, it's not every client. It's once in a, it's, it's enough that I got the certificate and, and did the training, but a lot of people just need to learn how to use their systems just better, more efficiently, save time. Is that what you would say would probably be one of the biggest challenges is just people really not taking the time to learn the system they already have? I would say that that has a lot to do with it, especially in um, the treatment plan presentation portion. Um, so most software will do the heavy lifting for you when you're estimating patient portion. 
You should li literally just need to put in a treatment plan and the software, if you have the information entered correctly in your software, it'll spit out a, a pretty accurate treatment plan um, if you're using your software right. And that's usually the most stressful part because the presenter feels an obligation to the patient to get as close as possible. As a matter of fact, sometimes they get so stressed out because they're so afraid to be wrong. You're, you might be wrong. Insurance companies don't give you exact numbers, um, but they also are actually working a little harder and um, they're just um, doing the hand paper, you know, like the hand calculation type of thing. And um, then they have printed out a treatment plan, crossed the numbers out and handed the patient something else, which basically says what we printed out doesn't mean anything but a hand. I mean, it just kind of makes you look like you don't know. And that discourages the patient from paying you up front. Well, let's get into the nitty gritty of exactly what um, the dental support essentials does. Is it just coming in and helping them see where they're missing stuff. Like why, if I was a doctor, why would I see, seek you out? And then what are the surprises I'm going to learn you also do? Okay. Well, uh, my mantra is teach you how, or do it for you. So, um, I can teach you how, if, if well, all you need is training, we, we do in office visits. I even have a, uh, an in office visit where either I can come in and train your staff, but I also have one where I bring a doctor too, and she trains the clinical staff. So uh -huh. we have that. Um, then we also have where maybe you have enough staff. They just don't have enough time to get it done. And then we take off the non pay we take, we'll do the billing remotely. We'll do the eligibility remotely. We um, have one practice where we answer the call, answer the phones and make all the appointments for seven locations. So we basically, whatever your front desk does not have time to do, we have somebody here who has time to do it, but it's mostly around the front desk area of the office. It's usually billing. It's usually accounts receivables we will work on your schedule. It's not mostly, we will do that, but most of it is the, the financial part of it. So teaching you how to use your software, doing it for you, putting the stuff in your system, all of that kind of thing. So it really just helps them have kind of a, a, a holistic look at, okay, what do we need to do operational wise mm -hmm. and how can we fill in those holes? Um, I should have asked this earlier. Are you pretty exclusive dental? I am, ex uh, yeah, I am exclusively dental. I, I know dental like the back of my hand. Um, nice. I, I have toyed with bringing on a medical biller mm -hmm. for my surgeons and my sleep apnea doctors. But for the most part, I am finding that um, medical billing isn't there yet mm. for dental. Um, a lot of times because patients' deductibles are usually oh. bigger than the bill. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so uh, what's the biggest pushback you get when it comes to you telling people what you do and you know, going to come into the office? I'm assuming there are maybe a few players inside of the office that aren't thrilled to have you there. Well, nobody likes change, and mm. so at, when you come in as a consultant, consultant's a dirty word to a lot of staff members. Um, but there's a couple of things I've, I've learned to put my foot down over the years about a couple of things. The first thing is if you are using me to put your staff in line or threaten them that they're not going to do a, like, if they're not going to do a good job. They're going to be replaced. And then we're not going to do business. Cause I am here. I was that burned out office manager who was spread too thin. I'm here to make your office managers life easier not harder. <laughs> and, um, but sometimes that does mean a pain, uh, changing some habits, changing how you use your software. But so that's one of the things is a lot of times the staff is hesitant to learn of a new way of doing things. Cause they feel like maybe that means their job is going to go away. Um, mm -hmm. but most of the time it's because there's not enough hands to do the work. Right. And so that's what we are. We're those extra hands. So that's, that's the biggest issue that I run into. Occasionally we get somebody who is resistant to change and it's a blessing that they resisted the change because they exit and change is allowed to take place. Sure. But um, most of the time, the biggest 
the biggest issue is that the staff feels like they might be going away if mm. you introduce new stuff. So it's really important to make sure that their staff knows that you are helping them. You are getting yeah. them the help that they need and not that you're, you know, you're doing something to, you know, make them act right or, or something like that. Usually they do end up acting right when they are not frustrated all day long, every day. Like you're, you're, you're supplemental to what they're already doing. Yeah. I think it's very interesting that, um, you mentioned that about if, if the doctor wants you to come in to kind of put people in place or whatever. I, I remember specifically talking to a client who was having some pretty big staff challenges. And I can't believe I just said the word staff. I usually were, use the word team, but in this case, he had some staff infections. And so I had, uh, I was talking to him anyways, and he was like, you know what, maybe I'm just, maybe I'll just hire this certain group. And I hear that they are really good about coming in and just firing people and I don't have to deal with it. I was like, that's a terrible way to manage your company, right? Because eventually you're going to have to deal with it. Like be a leader, stand up. Well, Don't- that's, that's exactly, that's exactly right. And, and that's why, that's why I teamed up with the, with Dr. Leslie Pasco. Um, and she, I mean, when we, I, the last time we went into an office, she spent most of her time with that doctor teaching mm-hmm. that doctor how to be a leader. She did talk to the clinical staff. She even, she even had their, like, she even made them move their setups and just like everything's systematic. It just flows from the front to the back and it was just beautiful. But the most time she spent, and even I, she and I agree on this wholeheartedly, it starts at the top mm-hmm. and you, you have to be able to be the, to be the leader. So if, if I were to come in to a practice that needed that, we'd start there first before we started with the staff. Wow, that's super important. So let's talk about some uh, success stories that you've had. Some, you know, you've gone in, you've maybe seen something that was like, ah, that made you cringe a little bit, but you're able to turn it around and make it successful. And now they're running like clockwork. Well, um, I had a practice one time where the doctor told me he had a million dollars in unpaid claims. And when I went, yeah, and I went in there and I was literally handed a grocery bag full of EOBs. This was an office in Ohio. So I was able to drive there and it turned out that his, he had lost some staff members and he didn't replace them. So he's saving money on payroll. Right. Mm -hmm. And what happened is they didn't have time to do everything that they were doing. So they were just taking the checks and putting them in the bank and putting the EOBs off to the side and never posting them in the software. So the doctor wasn't going to get paid a million dollars. He already had the million dollars in the bank, but he, um, he didn't know it. And right. you know, that means his taxes were, I mean, it wasn't, 50, it wasn't $50. It was something that would affect his tax bill and all of those types of things. And so it was literally, I I think we had three people working for a month, just getting that um, all set up and setting it up right so that it worked. And then it was, it was like clockwork. Every, every, the only time we ever really had in-depth conversations with that, like, you know, serious issues was when, a, when an insurance plan changed, well, then we would have to have a deep discussion. But most of the time it was like, how's it going? Everything's great. And it, it was like clockwork for them. So that was, that was one thing that, but that was an easy, that was an easy fix. Um, I did one practice set up that uh, it was a young doc who bought from two retiring docs. And um, so there was enough dentistry because they hadn't been doing crown and bridge or anything for, you know, they had been slowing down. So it was enough to keep one doctor busy really six days a week if he wanted to, but they had no computers. They had paper schedules, one for each doc, and they had those yellow ledger cards. And this was, this was it. This was in the last three years. (laughs) Wow, really? They were using a typewriter. (laughs) <laughs> and yeah, I remember the doctor said, I didn't even know I could still buy typewriter ribbon, but I had to. And so not only wow. did we have to teach them insurance, but we had to teach them how to use computers. They didn't know how to email. We had what? to, we, yeah, like they were, they were people, they didn't know how, I remember the conversation I had with this one person. She, 
I, I, there was a check that kept coming to the office that was supposed to go to the, the person in the next office next door. And I said, anytime you see a check that looks like it comes from an automatic bill pay service, you need to look twice at it because you don't want to cash the wrong person's check. And um, she was like, what's automatic bill pay? <laughs> I mean, this is, these are the conversations I had in that office. I said, it's when you go online with your bank and pay your bills instead of writing checks. She's like, oh yeah, I don't pay bills. I'm like, you don't write checks at all? She's like, no, my, my, my uh, fiance does that. I'm, okay. I'm like, but I mean, it was one of those, but it was also an area where we didn't have much of a hiring pool. It wasn't, um, it was out it was an area where when it was raining, you could call your patients who were farmers and fill your chairs. I was going to say, this has yeah. got to be like either 19, uh, you know, <laughs> 63, or it was, you know, in the yeah. middle of nowhere, like one of those, one of those stories that you would see in like a Hallmark movie where some, you know, person from the big city comes into the town and, and yeah. they don't even have computers. Yeah. I, yeah. I, it was a, it was far enough away that I had to go stay in a hotel and I was literally the only guest of the hotel in that town. Oh, it was, it was that far out, but the, um, but that was what we had to take them from like terrible chart notes to uh, like never billing electronically ever to all of that. And we had, we did it in a matter of, um, Oh, digital x-rays, all of that. And we did that in a matter of two to three months. Now, mm -hmm. the unfortunate problem was that the staff ended up sort of retiring with the dentist because, I mean, it was, there was a lot of change, yeah, but, that's a change. but the patients who were starting to get uh, statements generated by a computer were calling going, oh my gosh, I can read my bill. It's not handwritten anymore. And <laughs> <laughs> and, and they were like, wow, welcome to the 20th century. I mean, the, yeah. the patients were kind of laughing about it. I was really surprised because I kind of expected a, the different reaction that now we're all fancy. And, and, right. <laughs> you know, they're, they're going to be upset about it, but people tend, people tend to like clarity when it comes to their money. And oh, they, so, yeah, yeah, they certainly do. So that was, that was something that I, I will never forget that office. I didn't, I knew, I know there's offices with paper charts and film x-rays, but I didn't know there were still offices with paper schedules or and typewriters no computers or typewriters. typewriters. <laughs> like yeah. They could sell that typewriter and make probably a good, good amount of money for collectors that are out there. Wow. That's yeah, it crazy. was, it was amazing, but it was also, um, it was actually kind of sad to me because when I looked at how much money had fallen through the cracks sure. that those doctors, the, the sellers never cashed in on, they never yeah. got, and they, they didn't care. They were ready to go. They were yeah. ready to enjoy life outside of the office. But when I saw that, I just thought that to me, when I saw what, how the collections improved just by changing to a more efficient system, I was like, you know, that's, that's a house. Yeah. I, I, and then and that's what I said to one staff one time they had a software change and something wasn't working. And I said, you guys realize that you guys are losing the equivalent of an entire person's salary mm. right now. And they all like, when you put it in real terms, then yep. they're like, Oh wow. Okay. I was like, we can fix this, but we have to be on it. We can't let it sit. And that's, that's the biggest thing is how long things sit. You really only have a year to get it collected. Wow. Wow. That's a really good story. Thank you for telling that. That's a, I love <laughs> stories like that where you're just like, you know, that's happening in the world. You know that there's, you know, that's not the only one, but when you come across it, you're just like, wow, that's shocking. There's that episode, there's that scene in the movie, The Proposal, right? Where she goes to use the, she's up in Alaska and she goes to use the fax machine and it, she turns it on and you hear the dial up noise, you know, the old screeching and stuff. Yeah. What, what's going on? What, what is this? What is it? I'm sure there's still some people out there. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. There are. I, I don't want to offend anybody, but you know, if you still have an AOL account on your Gmail I, for, for email, I mean, I'm just saying, come on. Or, or what's the other one? Uh, uh, Earthlink. Earth, Earthlink. Yes. Yeah. I had an Earthlink account. I had no shame in, the, in that game, but I, I mean, if I still had it, I'd be, there'd be a problem. Yes, that's yeah. true. Hey, you know, I, I do, I, I do have a number of doctors that have AOL accounts, but for the most part, 
their claims are electronic. <laughs> nice. That's good. That's awesome. Wow. That's awesome. So, uh, so you've obviously had some success with this. What is going, what do you see with the industry right now? What's the, like kind of the next wave you're in the, the trenches. What's the next thing that people should be looking out for that will help them shift their business faster as whether it be because of Corona or whether it be just how evolution is happening. Well, I am, I am waiting for the day when we actually get somewhere with insurance companies where they all give us, they're all required to give us the same information per patient. I'm, I'm begging mm-hmm. for that day. I truly believe that's going to be solved with software more than it's going to be solved with a, a person. I, of course, it's going to require some representation, some lawyers, some things like that. So I don't think we should be giving up on the American Dental Association or any representative group because we're not going to get anywhere without, without them. Um, but that has to happen. I do think the software is going to continue to get better and easier. Um, I'm noticing a big trend in web-based software. And what I'm noticing with web-based software is the doctors love it. It is made by doctors and it is geared towards clinicians and their office managers and their billers and their financial people hate it. Um, because it is doesn't do all the same things that the old Dentrix does. It doesn't give you all the same reports and things like that. So I, I suspect three to five more years from now, the accounting part of web-based software will catch up to the clinical part because that's what the focus was, right? It was made by doctors and they got everything they wanted clinically. And every time I show a doctor that they're like, wow, I'm sold. And then I look at the other part of it and I'm like, don't buy it yet. Wait three more years. <laughs> if, if I can't plant print an outstanding claims list from your software, it's not done yet. <laughs> um, but that, that's one thing I'm seeing a big trend in web-based software. Uh, I'm starting to see a trend in paperless paperwork, you know, patient registration. Uh, we, need to, we need to make sure that our patients aren't good at homework. We need to make sure they truly fill that form out. You have to look at it after they send it back into you. I've noticed since COVID, a big trend in patient uh, offices changing to, you know, paperless paperwork, as you might say, but then we're getting not enough information to, to bill their insurance. And it's because it's now the patient's job to give the information and not right. the Nancy Drew at your front desk who had to go hunt it down. Um, so that's a shift and that's going to help us too. Um, when the patients have to work really hard to get the right information in order to get their claim paid, um, then they're going to pay attention to what their insurance is and whether or not it's worth their money or their time. I really believe that educating patients on what a good insurance policy is and what they should be asking for is what's going to change how insurance covers. Um, so those are some of the trends. The biggest uh, shakeup I've seen, though, is that when the pandemic shut almost all the dental offices down for a month and a half, a whole lot of people reevaluated their careers. Mm-hmm. And so the dental offices are opening up with less staff. Yeah. That's and happened in the space too. Yeah. And so I in that in the time frame from March to June, I have trained more spouses of doctors to do the office manager job. I wow. have um, trained dental assistants to be office managers. Like mm-hmm. I have I have started to see people moving around, you know, it's it's kind of like a reassess and use what you got. And I'm all for that. That's why I say make sure your software can do it before you buy a new thing. Sure. Um, but yeah, that's that's the biggest thing that I have seen. I I used to never see a doctor's husband or a doctor's wife um, really it was like pretty rare. It used to be kind of like the staff used to hate it, but now it's like, you know, people who own the business are coming together and, and, and making sure it's successful. But yeah, I've trained more spouses who don't even work in that industry in the last few months than I have in the uh, last five years. Which for me, I I get, right. It's like the, you need that person there to help out. It also is one of those things I'm like, please uh, get somebody actually who wants to be there, who isn't going to affect your relationship is, is not going to, you know, I deal a lot with the relationship side of stuff. And so there are times where there are doctors and their wives or their husbands who work together and it's not the best scenario. So 
Yeah, I, I hear it. Like I get it. There's the, the ox is in the mire right now. Things are are, cha- are 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 challenging, and as soon as we can get back up to full team members that actually are are there to do the job they were hired for, we need to do that. So well, yeah. yeah. And so outsourcing has increased too. What we oh. what we do because they don't have the staff members. I my newest client literally just lost her staff. And so we just had to take it over, go back in, dig them out and get them. And and I got a client through the pandemic who lost her staff and had $60,000 that needed to be collected and she didn't have anybody to do it. And she didn't know how to do it herself. So um, that's, that's a huge blessing to have somebody like you there. I mean, that's where services like what you guys do come in, not just handy, but are very valuable. And I'm a huge fan of the idea of finding other people to do the things I don't need to be doing or need to have to happen in our office. Mm-hmm. There's a book that just came out yesterday called uh, Who Not How by uh, Dan Sullivan. And that's that's the key, right? Is figuring out who can do this for me, not how can I get this done? Yeah, absolutely. And we're also, I we're the security for the doctor. There, there are several doctors who... Um, are afraid to put their foot down and make changes because they're afraid if their staff leaves that they're going to be lost. And now it doesn't matter who goes on vacation, who quits, who gets married and moves away or any other reason they might leave your practice. You're not lost. You're not going to lose revenue. You're not going to lose anything because this is just a back. um, I like to call it like a a back office system that just runs in the background, like clockwork. And that's, that's what we like to do. The claims go out every day. The patients are seen every day that, and you don't really, the only time we call you is like, Hey, guess what? They need to know, you know, if you're left-handed or right-handed. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sometimes they ask for crazy details. Crazy <laughs> well, you had mentioned earlier, I think that's another a good thing to reiterate here. As you mentioned earlier, that when it comes to that front office part of things, whether you need people to answer the phones for you, whether you need people to and make those appointments to the bill collection. I and mean, basically the only thing you're not doing is, is greeting the client when they walk in. Yeah, honestly, we can't replace the patient relationship. We, but what we can do is make it so that the person who is greeting the client is not also talking to the insurance company and being frustrated. Because yeah. if you've ever listened to someone making insurance calls, I mean, I have a room full of girls. We joke that it's a pirate ship, but there's no patients in the waiting room hearing the pirate comments that come out because of the frustration. I've said this three times, represent, like I hear them yell representative <laughs> three or four times. That's but, funny. but yeah, that's, that's kind of, and just think about what that does to you if you're doing that all day long. Um, you can't be the sunny, warm, engaging person if that's what you're doing every, every half yeah. hour. And I think one of the great things about what you guys are offering and what I, uh, what I hope that people will think about is it is a, I mean, you are helping them collect and make at the end of the day, make more money. Yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of times as business owners, we tend to walk over the dollars to get to the dimes, right. Where we're, we're so worried about spending money on something where I could just hire somebody to do it. And they're doing it quote good enough and not think, you know, for that hire, for whatever you're going to, uh, whatever you're going to invest in hiring someone to do this for you, whether it be answering the phones or whether it be doing the collections, you are going to make up for that. Your ROI is going to be so much greater than just hiring a warm body to do it for you. And I would even submit that what we were talking about just a moment ago, your ROI business-wise, but your ROI relationship-wise is going to be way bigger when you're not bringing in your spouse or your daughter or, you know, your best friend's mother to do it. Oh, I, I agree. I agree that there are a lot of people whose marriages are better off if they leave work at work and yes. don't bring it home. Totally. Um, and then there are people like there are people who just need to be able to trust somebody. And that's the only reason they're really making their wife do it. You know, they're, they're, mm-hmm. or their spouse do it is because they don't know who to trust. And this really is back to it again. This is whether or not you get paid for the work that you do. Mm-hmm. And there's no training for that part. Like it's, it seems to me, of course, that's why I'm at this end of the, the office, but it seems to me that it's pretty important 
and there should be training invested in it, which is why I start, I've developed a training program. I have online courses for people to learn oh, about cool. how to do insurance, how to set up your systems. And, and, and even, I even have a course on credentialing on how to credential. So oh, they can wow. just, just, just go to my website and, and click there's, there's, um, there's five courses. The six ones are going to be published next week on treatment plan presentation. And yeah, that's kind of how we started. Cause sometimes all you need is a course. Sometimes you need, you need a service. That's great. Wow. That's really cool. It seems like you've got all the boxes checked and how you can help out your clients. And that's, that's amazing. Well, Gosh, thank you so much for being a part of the show today. And we've come to the part of our show where we do what we call our six questions that are just kind of rapid fire, get to know you a little bit more. And are you willing to play? I'm willing to play. Awesome. Very Is there cool. a buzzer? Is there there's no buzzer? No no there's no, there's no uh, trap door. Okay. That would, be fun. that would be fun. You know, there are some times where I'd be like, okay, that's enough buzz. No. <laughs> All right. So as you are looking into all of these practices and, and seeing what you're seeing, this is really super relevant to what you do. What do you believe is the most expensive thing that private practice owners are missing in their practice? Um, they're missing the pre-work, the pre-game stuff. Almost the success of your finances happen before the patient arrives and wow. the pre-work's not done. Isn't that, it, isn't it, that the... That's, that's like in everything in life, right? It just makes so much sense. That's Actually, so I, I annoy everybody by saying pre-work costs less than rework. I pre-work, not rework. That's Ooh, one nice. of the I like that. trademark Sherry. Tra TM. <laughs> TM. <laughs> I love it. All right. Uh, what's a book that you believe every private practice owner should read? Um, well, I like the E-Myth. Okay. Um, I, I, I really like reading the e-myth. I've read a bunch of the, I read Manal's book just recently. I love Manal's book. Great. Um, yeah, that's a good book. And then of course your um, manual on your software. Oh, good. Yeah. Cause then you'll find <laughs> out what it actually can do for you. Right. Yes. Well, um, that what I love about what you offer for, um, for your clients really fits into the e-myth there too, right. About working in your business versus on your business. Mm -hmm. and or vice versa. And I often say, are you a practice owner or you're a practice operator? And the more you're doing the minutia that somebody else like yourself could be doing, you're, you're being an operator. You're not being an owner and you need to be more of an owner. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, speaking of books in my book, the practice RX, I focus on team culture and team performance as the foundation for business growth. When you are visiting these practices, when you're talking to people, what do you see as the biggest challenge private practice owners are facing with their teams and their office culture? Um, well, there's a lot of people in survival mode right now. And mm. when they're in survival mode, they're all worried. I mean, the, the whole world's on fire and everybody's worried about their future. And when you see that, you see a whole lot of what's in it for me, protect myself, type of mentality, which doesn't work very well in a team environment, because when we communicate that we're all out for ourselves and we're all separate individuals, then that our patient relationship is the difference between you and the doctor down the street. It's how the doctor feels about you. It's not whether or right. not you're a better doctor. Um, they're going to go down the street for that $50 discount, but really they, unless they feel strongly about you. Yeah. So um, that's kind of what I, I'm seeing is that you have to reassure your, your team that they're all together and that we're all in this together because the teams are smaller now. The, the, the work is spread out farther. There are not just front and back people. There never should have been and never should have been the back versus right. the front. Yeah. But if, if you can get that whipped by talking to Dino, yes. <laughs> you can get that whipped. Um, that's going to make the difference in the patient relationship. And it's all about the patient trusting you. You're mm -hmm. there. You have to estimate what they're going to pay you. They have to trust you. Mm -hmm. to, to write that $500 check. If you say you're unsure and you think it might be, and I don't know, but I'm going to do the handwritten math on top of the, then they're oh, going to go, yeah, you know what? I I'll pay you when you know. Right. And when they walk out that door with finished dentistry, you go to the bottom of the list as far as priorities of people. Yep. To pay. That's so right. it's the confidence and the creating that, creating that we're all one team. We all know what we're doing. And even if we don't, you don't know that. So well said. Love it. 
Um, how can listeners reach out to you? What's the best way they can reach out to you? Well, they can go to my website, which is dsepractice.com. Mm-hmm. They can call me. Um, so they can call my cell phone. Um, you know, I, I, I may have to call you back, but it's 614-915-5780. Um, they can email me. And that is my name, Sherry with one R and an I. So S H E R I dot jolly, just like tis the season to be jolly. Nice. Dental support essentials.com. I didn't think about that domain name when I started, but it was really long. But, <laughs> but yes, D E S dot com is, is, is probably the fastest way to see really an in depth way of, of everything that Sherry does. And, Like she said, I'm looking up on the online courses. Everything's there. It's really, really great. Really thorough. Um, What's the best advice you've ever received in life or business? Um, It was from my mom. Uh, She told me to quit taking it personal when things go wrong at work. Gosh, that should be the mantra for everybody and every office, every team member. Yeah, I, I had when I started, I started in my house. So the people who started working with us were in my house. They were my friends. And mm. so as we grew, not everybody came with us. And when I started losing those initial first core group, um, I took it real personal. And my mom said, it's not personal. It, it Stop taking it personal. This is part of what it is and your failures aren't even personal you tried something you worked hard it didn't work move on they did, I was like, their, they did their part of their journey now let them yeah. go yeah. yeah and that was that was i was like well i didn't i wanted you to tell me that everybody's bad <laughs> and then that's I, not what i was looking for mom that's not what i was, yeah that's not what i was looking for but it's true don't take it personal very true okay what's the best resource or tool that every private practice owner should be using to grow their practice I truly believe it is uh, word of mouth referrals. Um, so they mm-hmm. should be getting their patients to sing their praises. That is the mm-hmm. best way to get it to work for you. That's it's the word of mouth referral. When they're happy, they tell their friends. Yeah, that's so true. So true. Old school, still same way. Well, Sherry, thank you so much for being a part of the episode today and and giving everybody some really good things to think about and how they can look at their practice maybe a little differently. And and hopefully, whether it be with you or another company to outsource more, to be willing to look at that as an option, because I think it's really, really powerful. But of course, our goal is to help you uh, get that word out there about how you are changing the world, especially right now and affecting the world in the the days of Corona, if you will, right? Yeah. It's so. true. It's sh- it shook everybody up. It's changed. It's reorganized everybody. Yeah, for sure. Well, we appreciate you being here. Thanks again. Well, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Good. Everyone, I hope that you got as much value out of this as I did and were able to take many notes and please reach out to Sherry and find out how she might be able to help you in your practice. Again, our goal here every episode is to help you be more proactive, more productive, and more profitable in all areas of your, of your life. Thank you again for tuning in to the Propreneur Podcast. We'll see you on the next episode, everybody. Thanks so much again for listening to the Propreneur Podcast. We really appreciate your support. If you haven't subscribed already, please make sure you do so. Also, if you feel like you might be a good fit for our podcast as a guest or know somebody who you think would be, go ahead and email us at dino at dinowatt.com. Again, thanks for support. We'll see you on the next episode.